Double acceptance sampling plans aren't terribly common in the food industry, but it's still nice to know how to construct a double acceptance operating characteristics or OC curve just in case you need to know how to do this at some point. This is a bit more involved than constructing an OC curve for a single acceptance sampling plan as there are a few extra steps and a second curve to generate. In this video, we'll look at the steps for constructing a double acceptance operating characteristics curve and we'll actually construct a point on one using an example problem. First, let's review what double acceptance sampling plans are. In a single acceptance sampling plan, you take your sample and then you make an accept or reject decision based on that sample. In a double acceptance sampling plan, your first sample can give you three outcomes. You get the same accept or reject decision and you can also get a decision to resample. If you do that, you take your second sample and then you accept or reject. There's no more sampling after that because it's a double acceptance sampling plan, so you have up to two samples. To do this, you have two sets of acceptance criteria. In your first sample, you have C1 and R1. So your acceptance criteria and your reject criteria for your first sample. You accept the sample if the number of nonconformities in your sample is less than or equal to C1. And you reject if the number of nonconformities is greater than or equal to R1. You resample if the number of nonconformities is between C1 and R1. So you don't have enough information to make a decision in that scenario. In your second sample, you have again your accept and reject criteria, and they could be different from your first sample accept reject criteria, and they often are. So here you have C2 and R2. You accept your sample if the combined number of nonconformities from your first or second sample is less than or equal to C2, and you reject if the combined number of nonconformities between your first and second sample is greater than C2 or greater than or equal to R2. And we'll get to why that is in just a minute. First, let's take a look at the OC curves we have. So we have our single OC curve for the first sample we get, and then we have our combined curve for the combination of the first and second sample. And if you're wondering, well, why do we have the combined curve instead of the first and second sample? Is because we're looking at the probability of acceptance here. And the probability of acceptance is a combination of your first and second sample. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense to calculate the curve for just the second sample because what we're really doing here is comparing a single and a double acceptance sampling plan. So in your single plan, this would be your curve. You just stopped after one sample. In your full double acceptance sampling plan, this is the combined probability of acceptance. So you can see that bump that the second sample gives to your probability of acceptance. This is what these curves generally look like. They may change shape based on your sample size and your accept reject criteria, but your combined curve will always be greater than your single curve. And that's a key part of double acceptance sampling is that it gives you a greater chance to accept your lots. Let's take a look at how to calculate a double acceptance sampling plan curve use an example. I could go through just the pure numbers with variables. That gets very confusing very quickly if you don't have a good head for probability. And it's much easier to understand what's going on if we have numbers to plug in so you can see how the values get calculated with actual numbers. Here's a sampling plan we have for these M&Ms. Maybe we're checking for chips or broken pieces, anything like that. But out of a total lot size of 2,400, our first sample size is 150. Our second sample size is 200. Our first reject criteria is four. Our first acceptance criteria is one. And our second acceptance criteria is five. And we have enough information for this to calculate both OC curves. Before we do that, let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. First, do we actually need capital N, our lot size? No, we don't. 
that actually doesn't enter into the calculations for the single or double acceptance sampling plan. So if you ever get a problem like that, if your sample size is not a percentage of your lot size, you can just totally ignore that lot size. So don't worry about that. Second question, what's R2? Because we saw on that diagram a few minutes ago that we had R2 as our second reject criteria. I'm not gonna answer that question just yet. We'll get there. We need to see the decision tree first for this answer to make sense. And that pairs with our third question, which is how do we know how to take a second sample? Because we just have a bunch of numbers here. How do we translate that into accept, reject, and retest? What we need to do is draw ourselves a sampling decision tree. Plugging in the information we had with that problem. In our first sample, our acceptance criteria was one, our reject criteria was four. So that means if we have one or fewer nonconformities in our first sample, we accept, we're done. And if we have four or more nonconformities in our first sample, we reject and we're done. If we have two or three nonconformities in our first sample, we can't make the decision to accept yet because we missed our acceptance criteria, we're too high. But we can't know for sure to reject because we don't have four nonconformities, we have two or three. And that's when we take our second sample. So if we have two, we have a branch, and if we have three, we have a branch. And this is why we need to treat those two cases separately because they're controlling how many total nonconformities we can end up with in sample two. If we remember our acceptance criteria for the second sample was five, and that means we can have a total of five nonconformities between the first and second sample. So if we start out with sample two coming in with two nonconformities already, we can have another three before we hit five and still accept. So if we have three or fewer nonconformities in our second sample, we make the accept decision. If we have four or more nonconformities, that means we have at least six, we reject. And we stop there because we have double acceptance sampling. We don't need to go any further down that tree. So we move to the second branch of the tree where we had three nonconformities coming into sample two. If we want to hit our accept criteria of five for the second sample, that means we can have up to two nonconformities and accept. If we have three or more, that means we have at least six nonconformities and we need to reject. And so that brings me to what is R2? If we look at this tree, R2 has to be six because C2 is five. If R2 is not six, that means we have another undecided region, but we can't have that because we're not in multiple acceptance sampling, we're in double. So we have to stop at our second sample. And that means R2 must be six for this scenario. We've got our tree, we know what's going on, and we can feed this information into the calculations of our OC curves. So if you remember that graph, we had two of them. We had our single acceptance curve, we had our combined curve. So our single acceptance curve is going to be calculated using the accept and reject information from sample one. Our combined is going to be using all of this information in the tree. And this is why it is so, so important to draw out your tree before you start any calculations. You're gonna get really tangled up if you don't draw your tree first because it will look different for different problems. And it gets very confusing if you don't have a good grip on how are you making your accept reject decisions. Let's get into those calculations. For our single acceptance curve, we calculate that just like we did for a single acceptance sampling plan. So no problem. If you wanna see the video on that, the link is below in the video description for this video. For our combined probability curve, we need to total up the probability of accepting on sample one plus the probability of accepting on sample two. So if we go back and we look at our tree, we have an accept here, we have an accept here, and we have an accept here. So in our little equation where we're adding all those probabilities together, we need to have three terms because we have three accept boxes that we need to account for. That means that we need to use probability rules. 
So in our probability rules, and means multiply or means add. This is just standard probability rules, and this is going to factor in to our equation, which starts out looking very, very, very messy. But don't worry, once we start plugging numbers in, once you see how all the probabilities start working, it will start to simplify itself. Here we go. I'm going to do this step by step. So we start with the probability of accepting in sample one. That's this capital I right here. And that is the probability of one or fewer nonconformities in our sample because C1 is one. Now, for our second sample, if we want to accept that, we have two different scenarios under which we can do that. If we start with two nonconformities from our first sample, we can have three or fewer from the second. Or the second case, we have three nonconformities from our sample and two or fewer from sample two. So we have one accept decision here. Remember, and means multiply. So both of these things have to happen at the same time for us to accept. That's the second one. Here's or, that means add. Our third one, three nonconformities from sample one and two or fewer from sample two. Both of these need to happen at the same time. And that gives us our one, two, three terms for probability of acceptance for a combined curve. If we want to write out what it looks like for our second sample, here we go. This two here is our second sample. So here we have two nonconformities the first time, three or fewer the second time. This term, we have three nonconformities the first time, two or fewer the second time. Putting that all together, remember I said we need three terms in our equation. So we add up the probability acceptance of first and second sample. This guy is our first sample probability. These two guys are our second sample. And I told you this looks pretty scary without any numbers in it. And that's okay. We'll put numbers into it in just a second. But I do want to point out first that these probability of two, probability of three or fewer, probability of three, probability of two or fewer, and so on, those are very specific to this problem. If your C and R values change, you're going to need to change your equation. You're going to need to redraw your tree. These numbers came from this particular tree. If you have a tree that looks different, you're going to need to change these numbers. But you can use this particular procedure regardless of what your tree looks like. Just be careful that you're putting in the right numbers for the tree you have. All right. So plugging in some numbers for our combined curve. First thing we need, NP01, NP02. So P0, you're just going to pick. Let's pick 1% or 0 0.01 fraction nonconforming in our population. So we're gonna hold that constant through this entire point. If you remember, our ends were different for our samples. So in the first sample, we had 150. Our second, we had 200. And that means our NP0 values for sample one and two are different. So if we go to our Poisson table, we have two different NP0s that we need to be looking at for sample one and two. So keep that in mind when you are looking up your values for probability of acceptance, you need to be looking at the right P0. So keep in mind what sample you're working on. We'll start with probability of acceptance for our first sample. So if we remember C1 was one, and so we're under NP0 is 1.5 because that's what corresponds to sample one. We go over to C1, we read and we see cumulative, remember, because we can have one or fewer, so we want cumulative, that's 0.558. And we're going to put a little star by that because that is a point that's going to show up on our OC curve. So we've got one of two points. Now we need to do our second curve, but we need to hang on to this number because it's part of the probability of acceptance for our combined curve. Remember, it's one of three terms, so we're going to hold on to that. Let's work on our Second round of sampling now. Here it is. So we have some numbers here. Where did they come from? And why do we have a note here that for the first sample, the probabilities are not cumulative? 
Well, let's pull up our Poisson table and let's take a look at our equation. So if you see a number or fewer, that's cumulative because it's everything up to and including that number. So it's totaling all those together. If you see just a single number like this, that is, I want the probability for that specific number. Not that number in fewer, not that number in more, but that number in particular. So this is where we can get really tangled around because we're using two NP zeros this time. Remember, your NP zero is dependent on what sample you're talking about. So this is your first sample. You need to use NP zero for your first sample. This is your second sample. You need to use NP zero for your second sample. So I'm going to go through this table. I'm going to highlight all the values that we're using so you can see how I'm getting them. Okay, the probability of two nonconformities in your first sample is right here, 0.251. We're using the probability for that specific point, not the cumulative probability, because I don't care what happened below that. I know I had exactly two. So I want the probability for exactly two. Now I need the three or fewer from sample two. So I'm going to go down to my second sample, MP0, and I'm going to get the cumulative probability for that because it's three or fewer. So there's my 0.251 and my 0.857. And the reason I'm multiplying them together, remember, these two things have to happen at the same time. So I have to have two and three or fewer happen. So and means multiply, so I'm multiplying them together. Looking at my second term here, I want the probability on my first sample of exactly three. And that's this number, 0.126. On my second sample to accept, I have to have two or fewer nonconformities. So moving down to my second NP0, I look that up and it's 0.677. So I put those two together and I multiply. Remember, they have to happen at the same time. So I have an and and that means multiply. I add all those things up and I get a probability of the second sample acceptance of 0.3. All right, but I'm not quite done. I need to add that to the probability of accepting on my first sample because it's a combined curve, not the second curve. So when I do that, I pull my 0.558 from the previous calculation and I add that to my 0.3 and I get 0.858 and that is the probability of acceptance when I have 1% non-conforming in my population. And I'm gonna put a star by that because that's my second important number here. Here's where the stars come in. So if I look at my double acceptance sampling curves right here, I have my acceptance for my first point, my single acceptance, and I have my acceptance for my combined curve but that's only one star out of a big long curve. And so if you remember from the single acceptance sampling video, we need lots of stars to fill in these curve shapes. So we need to do lots more calculations. And if you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is a really long process. Yeah, it is. It involves a lot of calculation and it's quite time consuming if you do it by hand. And that's why I like to set it up in Excel. And that does involve a little bit of not quite programming in Excel because you don't have to do any Visual Basic or anything like that, but it does involve some pretty complex formulas. And I do have a video on how to do that. I have linked it in the video description below. So if you wanna check out how to do this in Excel, it does speed up the process once you are familiar with how to plug in all the values and how to write the formulas in Excel. Regardless of how you do it, you will get a nice, combined and single acceptance curve. And so you can look at how your probabilities of acceptance differ. You can see whether or not that probability of acceptance is acceptable to you and your particular sampling plan, or if you wanna make changes to your sampling plan to get the probability of acceptance to where it needs to be for your particular product and process.